quick note at the top of this episode. First of all, we apologize for being away for a couple of months from the podcast. We have had some changes in our circumstances, both personally and professionally, both good and bad. That's how life is. And as a result, we weren't able to produce the podcast for the past couple of months. So we are back, but we will likely be posting inconsistently here and there just for funsies as we work on the podcast. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks so much. Welcome back to the Novelty Podcast, where we talk about books. We talk about books, and usually we roll into a lot of other things too, but we are doing a hardcore book episode today. Yeah, we're supposed to do another rapid one, which last time wasn't very rapid, but we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do our best. So we're gonna jump right in. I'm Alexandra. This is Emily. I'm Emily. Yep. Here we go. Okay. So today we are doing rapid fire books from specific genres. Yes. So let's start off, well, let's get this one out of the way, fantasy. We talked about it a couple episodes ago. Right, we had an entire episode on our favorite fantasy books. We went through a couple of different authors and both of us got to the point where we were like, oh, we like covered everything in that yeah. episode. We, had, we don't have a lot of fantasy titles to re- recommend. We kind of covered it all in that episode. So, so like Fantasy Rex, it's just like two episodes ago. <laughs> right. So after that, let's talk about gothic horror. Oh, gothic horror, which, you know, I have examples today because I have a lot of books, but we got to, we got to do, we do have to start with like Lovecraft as being the foundation. We do. Like, you know, that's love or hate Lovecraft for himself. Most people hate, like totally understandable. He does know how to write creepy. And I feel like you can't really write, read modern horror without being like, oh, that's Lovecraft. Yeah. That's Lovecraft. Yeah. And that too, you know? So like, that is definitely, I feel like foundational for anything you're reading. I agree. And I also feel like I really enjoy where uh, Lovecraft creeps into the other genres. So right. whether it's sci-fi or fantasy or some of these other things where we can bring in that vibe because it's just so juicy and delicious. It is. And I would usually show up here with vampire fiction, but also we have an entire episode on vampire fiction. Yeah. So I'm going to say for Vampire Rex, go to that episode. For oh, and and we have another episode I got to plug because this oh. is... Yes. Emily's Phantom of the Opera episode. We do have Phantom of the Opera episode where we go into like an incredible level of death from that story. So yeah. I'm not going to bring that up. I'm not going to bring up those those two very near and dear to my heart subjects. But I will say for my fantasy rec, I'm going to choose the Harrow Fair series by mm-hmm. Catherine Ann Kingsley. Mm-hmm. Um, I did talk a little bit about this book series on our episode on consent yeah. because it is a horror romance novel, yeah. which I didn't know that was a genre. And I've now found that that's like one of my favorite <laughs> genres. Before I start anything, say there are a lot of like adult content warnings on this book. So please do your research. Don't just jump in to mm-hmm. it and then yell at me in the comments. So anyway, <laughs> entire concept. There is yeah. a, it's like a small town in Connecticut where this like overnight, this fair just shows up in an, oh, and it's a night little, fair. Oh yeah. Yeah. People just like wake up in the morning and there's a, a new fair where this rolled yeah. into town and somehow set up overnight. Okay. It's repeatedly, <laughs> eventually throughout the story referred to as the man eating murder fair. <gasps> And it is like so delicious. It is just a really, really great story. But what I think to me puts it over the top is it does what I feel like horror should do. And it asks a lot of questions Mm -hmm. of the reader about things like why is pain important to the human Mm -hmm. experience? Why is loss important to the human experience? And I feel like that's when horror is at its best, when it's not just like, you know, scary and creepy. It's also being like, hey, we need to like talk about this, Mm -hmm. you know, why because honestly, like some authors will just throw in like horror stuff for the sake mm-hmm. of horror. And it's kind of like, well, that was not very cool. Like that mm-hmm. was just dumb. But like, I feel like when Catherine Ann Kingsley is writing horror, she's doing it in a way where, yes, you can just enjoy it mm-hmm. as like creepy, scary. But she's honestly also asking you to think about things. You know how I feel about deeper questions. Exactly. That's, that's what I want. It's, it's what like, I need. It's like they're at this level where entertainment and that's fine. But when you can find an author who steps up level, I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and I feel like, if I may say, that dark romance or gothic romance has, I'm like, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. Because yeah. I know that gothic, like from childhood. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> has been core. Looking at my future. <laughs> yeah. And the, anyway, so I went back and forth on a couple of ones. And because you mentioned that, I'm going to have to bring back one that I was like, oh, I should talk about now. I shouldn't. <laughs> but Something Wicked This Week Comes ah, by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. I read it a couple of years ago. Oh my gosh, it's so good. The movie's also good if you want to check that out. But another dark circus comes into town. Oh, 
the circus theme, I just like, I'm always drawn to that. Me too. I read Caravelle, which is like, not the best book ever, but it's like a circuit, another circus one and you don't really know what's going on and there's mysterious stuff and creepy stuff, but it's also kind of fun and intriguing. So that's, you know, another circus book, I guess. I'm not recommending it. It doesn't count on the list, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one I wanted to talk about is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Classic. Classic. You know, it's a, you don't know what happened here before. You have a creepy house that's also beautiful, but haunting. And there's a past and you're uncovering it. You have power dynamics and this new relationship. You know, it's sort of like you made your bed. Now you lie in it kind of situation. Oh no. What did you get into? Yeah. It's, it's really fun. Oh, and we've talked about this before too. Like horror centered around or gothic centered around a location like mm. a house oh those are just like the best I love it i know and that opening line last night i dreamed again of manderley yes such a he great opening line <laughs> so anyway rebecca okay gothic horror gothic all right horror. yeah next up oh did you pick did you want to talk about literature should we do literature next let's yeah. do literature okay Go. okay so for my classic literature i'm picking anna karenina i love this book it is top, top, top favorite. I blasted through it by the time I actually got to be a good enough reader to read it. I, lo I absolutely love, I love it. Anna Karenina, sweeping, amazing characters, so much richness and depth. I have never read so many amazing characters in my life. Just, I mean, it's Tolstoy, it's hard to beat his writing. He is truly fantabulous. That's my, that's my pick for like old classic. For modern classic, I'm gonna pick Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion. I read that earlier this year. Her prose, her structure, the dreaminess of it, the sparseness of it, beautiful. Okay, and, quick yeah. description on that one, because I don't know that one. So the story is that we're reading from the perspective of our female main character who is married to a Hollywood director. She lives in Hollywood, but she doesn't quite have anything to do. She's acted a few times, but in a couple of his mov movies, but is a little bit floundering in her life. And she's around these high powered people without really being grounded herself. There's some circumstances in their marriage things go awry, she has to make certain tragic choices, and it's a deeply sort of psychological narrative prose. Very dreamy. You get a lot of what's going on in her interior mind, All okay. right, but in an abstract sense. Nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. My pick for literature is I am doing um, The Complete Short Stories by Flannery O'Connor, which can we just talk about for a moment how fantastic this cover is? Can we also talk about this? Yeah, it matches my cup, so I just... I might like this. Anyway, um, so this is the all of the short stories that Flannery O'Connor wrote over the course of her life. Um, she wrote a couple of novels, and most people will tell you straight up, like, her novels are not anywhere mm -hmm. near her short story. Like, she yeah. is a short story writer. Yeah. Um, and because this is a complete life collection, I will say I feel like they do get considerably better as they go on, because that's the nature of writing. You get better the more you do it. But she is just a very very fascinating also got some gothic you know vibes to her like she was very heavily influenced by southern gothic right um she's known as like a grotesque writer which that does not mean what it means now yeah um it's more just like her stories are can be very weird and fascinating and mm -hmm. she's writing a lot about like the concept of the new south mm -hmm. and kind of i mean it is kind of sad because you do get the sense of like she um, a lot of hope for where the South was going during the civil rights era. And I don't mm -hmm. think that we've necessarily seen everything that she kind of had hoped was coming. Yeah. Um, but it is a really fascinating look at Southern culture in the moment that she was there. Yeah. So yeah, Flannery Connor. I do, I do recommend that people like concurrently like read about her work while reading her work because yeah. um, I think her work sometimes can be very opaque and it's great to like read other people's commentary on it and kind yeah. of get like background of who she was and how that plays into her work. Yeah. 100%. Category again. Oh, literature. That was That's literature. Right. Yes. We already did it. I already said mine. I don't get two turns. <laughs> but it's literature, so you could do two turns. <laughs> no, no, it's... Okay. Sci-fi. You want to go first on sci-fi? Oh sci man, sci-fi. Here we go. Cause this is like, this is one of my jams. Yeah. So I, I didn't, I did not stick to one in this one. I would That's do three okay. real quick. Yeah. So if you like, just like, like classic adventure sci-fi with heart, 
I Saved the Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. This is basically the story of a, a security robot who achieves sentience by watching telenovela. Yeah. So it's like... <laughs> That's hilarious! <laughs> it's hilarious. It's so heartfelt. And also it's just like got classic like sci-fi action in it. So I love that one. If you like kind of more like sci-fi creepy horror... Maybe with say, a little bit of a Lovecraftian oh, twist. Oh, just heavily Lovecraft. Yeah, then I say the Southern Reach trilogy, the first of which is Annihilation, which... I, I love the entire series. I've read it in like a week, but I will say Annihilation is my favorite mm -hmm. and it could be read as a standalone, mm -hmm. I feel like. Or if you just like crazy, campy, over the top sci-fi, I love Heart's Prisoner by Olivia Riley. It is obsessively marketed as a romance. It is like way more hard sci-fi horror, but like the kind of sci-fi horror that we were like watching in action films as like kids. Yeah. And I don't know, there's something like almost nostalgic about the way it's written. So mm -hmm. those are my three, like you got like, no matter where sci-fi plays for you, those are my three yeah. tops. Yeah. I have three too. Go for it. It's okay. a fantastic genre. I know. I do really like sci-fi. So Brave New World. I'm always reading classics, guys, even when I'm in other genres. There you go. Brave New World is fantastic. It blew my mind when I read it. Um, and if you haven't read it yet, especially if you like the Fahrenheit 451 or you really enjoy like the um, like 1984, you're also going to be a fan of Brave New World. I think it's core sci-fi. It's asking core questions about what does it mean to be human? Right. Um, which sci-fi is often asking that question. Um, it's asking a lot of questions about the stratification of society and how we like deal with humanity and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's tragic. It, it has a very sad ending. There is some trigger warnings to so do some research before, yeah, you, for sure. before you read it. Number two, Out of the Silent Planet. It's a trilogy but of sci-fi trilogy by C.S. Lewis. And I will say each of these books in the series is very different from each other. So when you go into the trilogy, just like be prepared <laughs> that it's not going to be like, oh, another adventure in the same style. But the first one is very classic sci-fi going on an adventure, exploring new extraterrestrial worlds and, and interacting with alien species and that sort of thing. So if you like that, it's really fun. And then thirdly, I have a sci-fi comedy, the classic Hitchhiker's ah, Guide yes. to the Galaxy. <laughs> I absolutely love this book. I read it every once in a while on audio. It's great for road trips. I've Laugh heard, out loud funny. I've heard the audio is done by Stephen Fry, right? Yes. I've heard that's fantastic. It's fantastic. I, I think there's a couple of different versions, but I always get that one if I can from my library. It's a great road trip book. If you are stuck in a car for a few hours on the way to somewhere and you want something fun and entertaining and wacky doodle and funny, go for it. Go for it. So those are my sci-fi recs. All right. Man, sci-fi. I know. <laughs> What's next? All right, let's do romance. Go. Okay, romance. Again, I'm reading classics in every <laughs> genre. So I'm here with Pride and Prejudice. I think, I mean, and it is sort of like both the source and the pinnacle of the romance genre of the marriage plot. It's a romantic comedy and nobody does comedy like Jane Austen. It's just between the pros and the characters that you love, that you love that they love each other, that you love that they're getting together. <laughs> I mean, it hits all of those. It's the type of story too that you can just do over and over again. It never gets old. There's a reason why it's been adapted so many times. Absolutely. And you know, at different versions have been written and all kinds of things. It's just so fun. It's just, it's just so, so archetypal. Yeah, and, and it, it just works all of the buttons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about you? What you got? All right, so I'm a huge romance reader, but I'm usually like a subgenre romance reader. I don't usually just read like straight romance because honestly, like usually not that good. Mm -hmm. But I did like decide to pick up the. It's called the Brown Sisters trilogy. It starts with Get a Life, Chloe Brown. This is my favorite book in the series, and this is like the only like straight romance. Like that is the plot yeah. that I really love. Um, the entire series is based on. The main characters are not characters you usually see represented in romance. So for like this one. So cute. Look how I, cute she is. I know. It's an adorable cover. Yeah. It just makes me happy. Yeah. Especially knowing those two characters and their, <laughs> and their cat. Oh. <laughs> um, so like the main character in this story is someone who suffers from severe chronic pain. Mm. Not usually a character that you get represented as like a main character in a mm -hmm. romance novel. And I just, the whole series is like that. Um, they have characters who are autistic you know, characters who come from like first generation families and have like that, the different things that you deal with that. And I just felt like the books were so much more meaningful being able to read characters that you usually don't read. Like these, mm -hmm. these characters are not standardized characters mm -hmm. that you get in romance novels. Cause like it tends to be like a very samey, same like they mm -hmm. look the same, they are the same type of people. Yeah. And so 
to see like representation like this. I feel like this is an example of representation done well, yes. not just being like, look, all the characters come from various different countries. So I did representation and like and not then, actually putting effort into representing right. those characters. And, or making it very surfacey, like, oh, oh it's yeah. like mentioned once and it affects nothing else in the story. Exactly. Whereas like this character, her whole life is represented by her physical limit limitations mm -hmm. and like, wanting to have more of a life but realizing like she's never there are limits to like what mm -hmm. that will ever look like for right. her you know so i know i found it to be like very meaningful while also just being very invested in this really sweet romance i saw i saw someone recently online being like i don't get why people like get alive chloe brown you know it's just like there's no like high drama and it's like people were like yeah, because it's about like real people trying to be yeah. a healthy relationship with each other and working through like real life problems surrounding yeah. that. It's not about like dark fantasy, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like you have picked the wrong genre for yourself. Exactly. Like if you want to just talk about like people trying to be healthy in a relationship, Talia Herbert is there for you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like one of my, okay, this is not, I'm not gonna go there. Next up. <laughs> oh, come on, you can't, well, okay. you can't start like that and then be like, no. <laughs> I think my favorite thing of like internet culture that I always like find is like such a great parallel is like people who are doing book reviews on books where it's like, the problem here is not the book. The problem <laughs> is like, this isn't the book for you. Right. And you haven't quite like, identified that for yourself which like i feel like i'm fairly sensitive to like i can review a book and be like hey this wasn't for me but i can see who it would be Before. for yeah um and, but and it's also like i always tie it in my mind with like people who write unhinged comments on the bottom of <laughs> recipes oh yeah or like i tried to make the this like gutter butter garlic chicken but i didn't have chicken and you're like that's kind of the main thing that's why the recipe <laughs> failed yeah i replaced it with tofu and it's like there you go. <laughs> yeah, we found the problem. This recipe was not for you. And so to me, it's like the same internet person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, we just, you're just always disappointed if you're that person too. Yeah. Like this is hurting you. Yeah. <laughs> just a little, a little more like, I don't know, insight, whatever. <laughs> Self-reflection. I don't yeah. know. All right, next. Okay, now we're in the spy slash thriller slash spy thriller category. Espionage. Espionage. All right, I am going for what is probably like the most famous spy novel anyway. Yeah. But for good reason. Spy Who Came in the Cold from the Cold by Jean Le Carré, which I would like to note, I feel like the reason that Jean Le Carré is so good at this genre is that he actually was a spy. Mm -hmm. Like he was writing from that context while he, uh, Spy Who Came in the Cold was his, I think, first successful novel, I think it was his second novel, but his first mm -hmm. successful novel. He was literally still in the British Secret Service when he wrote this novel and was writing it out of a frustration of what he was experiencing. Right. And most of his novels are based around like specific events that he experienced. Um, like his other major one is Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which is about a mole in the British uh, Secret Service. He was actually outed by a mole. Mm -hmm. So like these things are very personal to him. Very grounded in reality. Very grounded in reality. He's writing the emotions that people he worked with felt like with he worked right? So I feel like that's why he as a genre writer is mm -hmm. so much more successful than something like a James Bond ever will mm -hmm. be. Yeah. There's a certain fantasy that I have that <laughs> I just want to talk about when it comes to spy stuff. All right. Is <laughs> I'm really dorky, you guys. And I have this feeling when I see like large scenes of people working in offices that are like 1965, they're yellow, massive. Oh, yes. Everything's like tinged yellow. Why? The plastic has faded to a yellow. Yeah, there you go. The tape dispenser, the stapler, the miles of cabinets. I want to do that. I want it. <laughs> I want to be the boring researcher in the back of the MI5 office who just has so many files. <laughs> I want to be a paralegal. I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be a paralegal. <laughs> this is my aspiration in life. I want to file taxes. Do you want to work at the circus? <laughs> <laughs> do they have Do they have file boxes for me? According to John Le Carre, yes. Uh, okay, I, then yes. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh that circus. By the way, yeah, circus is what he calls the service. We were talking about a different circus earlier. Not, I'm like, I don't think I have a lot of files, Emily. That's like not the same at all. But okay, I'll roll with it. <laughs> like there is a part of my personality that's just like, oh, let me put the papers away. I want to do it so bad. Um, okay, so my thriller I'm choosing is The Maidens uh, uh -huh. by, what's his name? Michael Levy's? 
Wasn't it Alex Michelides? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Alex Michelides. <laughs> That's not important. Um, <laughs> Alex Michelides. The further I get, I read also the, um, the Silent Patient. The further I get away from The Silent Patient, the more and more I think The Silent Patient is quite mediocre, which is fine. It's his first novel. It's the first one out. I feel like The Maidens is quite a bit better than The Silent Patient. And the other thing that I will say, too, this is sort of like a self-discovery moment for everybody here in the audience, <laughs> is that uh, when I am newly reading in a genre, I feel like I just have an open heart and everything sparkles. And then, you know, the more you read in it, the more you're familiar you, you become with it, the more you're like, oh right. yeah, this one's good, this one's not as good, this one's working with the tropes better, blah, blah, right. blah. So I haven't read, read a ton of thrillers, so who knows if this will stay like ranked high for me because this is kind of like my first foray into it. But even between those two, I'm like, no, The Maidens. The Maidens is it for me because it's academic. We have a lot dealing with like sort of the classics department, which I did my degree in classics. There's a lot going there that's like just for me. I'm like the reader <laughs> for it. And that may not be for everyone. For this one, I did not see the twist coming. For The Silent Patient, I saw it from a mile away. And most people still, it's still a little obvious. Yeah, it's still on my list. <laughs> yeah, but they're both really fun for some thriller action. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Let's see, nonfiction? Nonfiction, oh. I'm like a huge nonfiction, especially history person. Yeah. So I did come in with this with two, because for me, these are like two different, re I tend to like read a lot of things that are not like usually re same readers read things. So yeah. I'm gonna go from two different perspectives. So Dead Weight by Eric Larson, I think is one of the most like emotional books I've ever read. It's so beautiful. It's the story of the last crossing of the Lusitania during World War One. Eric Larson's the type of person where you get the sense that he has read every newspaper article, every letter, every possible scrap of information that existed about this time era, um, and then weaves it into a narrative that can, like, reads like fiction, honestly. And, like, the whole thing is, like, basically, the Taylor spoilers because it's history. The Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat, and... So like the whole story is like basically this ship and this U-boat and the different things going on as they slowly go together. And I, I'm I, was, together. I was like reading this as an audiobook at work. And by the time like we got there, I was to the point where I was just like ready to scream, like just make it happen already. Because yeah. <laughs> it's so tense and so like so emotional. Yeah. But I feel like this is an easier book to read more generally. There is like one autopsy scene in here that like he says that he reader content warnings on but I don't think it's that big of a deal but mostly mm -hmm. it's just like a very emotional beautiful and like tragic story mm -hmm. I do think I read last year for the first time Mark Bowden's Black Hawk Down mm -hmm. I do think that's probably one of the best books ever written that is an incredible story and mm -hmm. an incredible way of telling that story but that is not for sensitive readers for sure. Yeah. So like, I would say like anybody should read that, but with also the caveat of like, I know not everyone mm -hmm. can read that. Yeah. Mark Bowden in general, I think is a really fantastic nonfiction writer. I read like six of his books in two months last year. So went on a binge, but Black Hawk Down is, stands up far and above anything. Like that is mm -hmm. one of the best, I feel like ways to do commentary on war. Mm. Whereas like Eric Larson, because he's writing about people from like a hundred years ago, you know, you get the sense he's read everything. Mark Bowden has talked to everybody. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that, like he will just sit and talk for hours mm -hmm. with the people involved in this. And mm -hmm. so his way of writing and telling their stories is so personal because he's letting them tell their own stories in essence. So mm -hmm. it's a really fascinating way of doing commentary on like modern warfare. Yeah. Emily is our resident, like, history buff, nonfiction reader. She reads way more than I do. I get my recs from her. So mine is a much more of, like, a pop nonfiction recommendation. I read Cultish last year. Oh, I am interested in that. I haven't read that yet, but I yeah. am interested. It is well written, and I think she, this book is kind of talking about things that are not full-blown cults, but are cult-adjacent, and mm -hmm. how they borrow from the strategies that full-blown cults use to influence us. Okay. And because you and I both listen to a lot of podcasts about cults. <laughs> okay, there's just a moment. Or books. There's just a moment in history where, like, all I wanted to read about was cults. Yeah, we we had a similar timeline. Where, and we're like, did you listen to that podcast? Yeah. yeah. About this. No, I didn't listen to that one yet. You know? And so I'm very interested in cult behavior. I'm interested in, you know, of course, how people get trapped in them or sucked yeah. into them, what makes you vulnerable to them, because of course, because we all are on some level. That's, I think, something that one of the main things that, like, is horrifying about mm -hmm. cults to me is, like, anyone's acceptable mm -hmm. to this. And it's like, the other thing is, like, even if we're not dealing with 
a full bone cold or even cult adjacent things like maybe MLMs or something like that that can be highly manipulative and controlling. The amount of messaging that we get through marketing, through politics, through the way our news stories are presented to us, pick your medium, pick your message. We're constantly being influenced. We're being influenced to buy skincare. We're being influenced to vote a particular way. We're just, it's just off the chain. The messaging. The messaging and the, and the attempt to control and shove and move your mind, your heart, your purchasing power, your vote, right. whatever, your time, your attention. And so I feel the pressure. I feel the shoves that are being oh, yeah. put onto me all yeah. the time. And so this is probably one that I'll like return to again, because I just think it's really helpful to keep top of mind as we make our way through this world that's constantly trying to push us in different directions and to sort of like recapture my autonomy. I feel like if you're not feeling those pushes, that means that you're just not aware of them because yeah. like no one is free of this in oh, this society. No. There are times where I sort of get like almost like angry at a certain point. I'm like, shut up world. <laughs> like, Stop telling me what to do. <laughs> that usually a point is like, no, I don't want to fix that about myself. I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. I'm broken. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. I actually, so I probably shouldn't say this, but there, I used to subscribe to real simple magazine and there was a moment when and I said, I am unsubscribed. Like I used to buy the physical magazine because it's pretty and I liked it. And their cover magazine was all of the things you're doing wrong with asparagus. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> done. That's it. You can take that and shove it. I'm going to be imperfect with my asparagus all day long and you can just deal with it. <laughs> I actually feel like that's a really bad choice for marketing. Like, if you want to capture people, it should be like 15 things you can do with our asparagus. Well, negativity really drives, you know? Oh, man. I, that would, yeah, that would make me angry too. Yeah, so I just like immediately was like, I'm going to beat you up real simple. Let's fight words, you know? So, and so then I canceled my subscription. And here we are. There's a real like rebellious thread underneath my personality. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> you can take that. You can take your asparagus somewhere else <laughs> so anyway that was my experience with real simple magazine <laughs> and the book is cultish, <laughs> and the book is cultish. <laughs> yes so yeah there you go i am very interested in that one that is on my long yeah. list of i want to read <laughs> it's a it's a good audiobook it's not it's short you'll get through it it'll cool. be fun yeah let's see what's last do we have anything left? Children's literature. Children's literature. Oh man, I didn't grab my copy of this. I am a series of unfortunate events. That is, which I actually read as an adult. Speaking um, of gothic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's just me. Um, uh, but I do feel like actually the book is like some children's books are not written with the like acknowledgement that parents are going to read this too. Series of unfortunate events. There yeah. are things in there that like children absolutely aren't paying attention to like it's right. read with the acknowledgement that parents will and probably should yeah. <laughs> read the same books as their kids it is such a fantastic i love absurdist fiction mm -hmm. first of all like i there are books i've read where i'm like this there is no plot to this none mm -hmm. but i just love the absurdity and there's unfortunate events is very absurdist it's very gothic in a way it's children's horror mm -hmm. um and i would say for parents I would read these before you let your children read them because you need to decide on the sensitivity level of your children because there is some imagery in there um, that could be scary. scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think children should be like kept coddled up. from the things that are scary. In yeah. This world. I think you just need to like be aware of your, your child's own level of sensitivity because mm -hmm. some children are more sensitive. Um, but I think that it is such a beautiful and moving story at its core, you know, and like, it's it's rough like the children like the things they suffer you know it's yeah. it's really rough but it's so beautiful and so funny and so ridiculous um and interestingly the book is ostensibly written by lemony snicket who is a character in the book actually written by daniel handler and when asked what was the inspiration for this he actually said it he's from a very very traditional jewish family mm -hmm. and it comes from the tradition of like oral history mm -hmm. in Jewish families about different things that their family has suffered. Yeah. And it's like, that is like the whole background mm -hmm. for the story. And it's like, man, just makes it even more fascinating. Like yeah. it does in a way feel like an oral history, like the way yeah. that he's chosen to write it, like, mm -hmm. because the character of Lemony Snicket does come through and like do oral commentary. And usually, usually his commentary is the absolute best part. <laughs> <laughs> the things that he comes up with. <laughs> yeah. And the baby said, yeah. Which meant. <laughs> <laughs> or I think one of the books, every book is uh, dedicated to his lost love, Beatrice. And one of them is like, to Beatrice, dearest darling dead. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So that that's my children's track. 
Mine is also a classic. No one was surprised. No one's surprised, but no one's disappointed either. Yeah. Uh, the Wind in the Willows. I actually read this first as an adult. So I saw like the movie and like, I, but I never actually read the novel. It was so sweet. It was so cozy. You know, if you're having a rainy day and you're holed up in your home with a hot cup of tea and maybe some a little sweet treat, maybe some biscuits, <laughs> maybe some cookies. So we got rain, tea, and biscuits. Those are important. Yeah. <laughs> and you want something to just snuggle up with to feel warm and cozy in your heart, please read The Wind in the Willows. It will cheer you. It will touch you. It's so sweet. There's a fun little adventure. The characters are so great. You know, it's little animals going on adventures. And I still, and it's also very well written, very descriptive, really fun language, because it's kind of older, because it's a classic. Think about it all the time. There's this like one scene where Mole and Rat, who are our two main characters, who become best friends, where they first meet each other. Aww. And it's so cute. And I have a little terrier dog who has sparkling little black eyes, <laughs> just like Rat. And so there's this little scene where he, where Mole sees him from across the river, because he's a river rat. And he's like, oh, who, who, there's two sparkling little eyes over there. He's going to go be friends with him. And that's just what my little dog looks like. And I'm just like, oh, I'm going to go be friends with him. <laughs> it's just the cutest, sweetest, bestest, wonderfulest animal fuzzy cozy happy i love it all the good things yes all the things so yours doesn't come with the same level of parent warning <laughs> there um there's adventure there's bad guys there's action there's a, a battle scene but much more in the style of like obviously cutesy little animals going on on war <laughs> just <laughs> cutesy Which... little animals at war yeah <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> their sabers are tiny. <laughs> okay, this is adorable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very much like Brian Shocks. I don't know if you ever read the books, the, like, like Madame Mayo and the... You didn't read these? No, so, I didn't. Oh my gosh, another series of cute animals going on adventures. <laughs> That's like more of a sixth grade. They were like chapter books. Like, oh, okay, yeah. One. Anyway. <sighs> I know. <laughs> Let me tell you about all the cute animal books. I'm going to go now. <laughs> we're going to have to talk after this episode. Okay. <laughs> anyway. So that's my pick for children's. We didn't, we forgot about mystery. So mystery, actual last, last. Mystery is an important genre. Which we should say also we have a whole episode on Agatha Christie. You Indeed. Can check it. Where we have so many Agatha Christie <laughs> recommendations. If yeah. you want to know what you should read for Agatha Christie, that episode is there for you. Yeah. But you are coming today with your favorite Agatha Christie. Yes, I am. Death Comes at the End. I love it. It's set in ancient Egypt. It's her only historical novel. Exactly. Who didn't grow up doing like Egyptology <laughs> in like, yeah. I, for me, it was sixth grade. Oh, yeah. When we learned yeah. about Egyptian stuff. So and, fascinating. And then, of course, the movie The Mummy came out when we were like, what, seventh grade? Yeah, something like, like that. Sixth grade. Yeah. I don't know. And so, like, going on the adventure with the mummy, hieroglyphs. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Book of the Dead. I feel like stuff. every child goes through a phase where it's just like, this, yep. yeah, this is a fascinating society. Tell me yeah. more. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Actually, I have a funny story. So we live in California, and there is the Rosicrucian Museum, which the Rosicrucians, personally, I think are weirdos, but they're really into Egypt, Egyptian stuff. And so they have a museum in Sacramento. For my school, we went on a field trip there. I was really excited about it because I was already into languages and mm -hmm. codes and ciphers and hieroglyphs and blah, blah, blah. All that. Everybody kept telling me, like my teacher, like all the people were like, and they have the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> and I was so pumped. Like I was pumped to see mummies, don't get me wrong, sarcophagi, all of these. I was papyrus. I have papyrus at home, actually, <laughs> as you do. Um, and I was so pumped about all of this, but I was the most pumped for the Rosetta Stone. I was so excited to see it. And so I'm like, the docent is taking her like tour of sixth grade kids like around or fifth grade, I don't know. And I'm like standing right in the front when we get over to the Rosetta Stone. I'm so excited, I'm like shaking. And like immediately I can tell <laughs> something's wrong. And the docent's like, and here's the Rosetta Stone. It's like hanging on the wall or whatever. That thing was plastic. <laughs> I, was, I was furious. I was just standing in front, like, probably, I was grumpy the rest of the time. <laughs> and they, they were like, Alexandra, are you okay? I'm like, the Rosetta Stone wasn't real. <laughs> I can see the seam for the plastic mold on the side. I had a rough time. This is why I knew this about her. So when I went to the British Museum where they actually have the Rosetta Stone, I brought her back a little one just to make yeah, up for that. It was, yeah, it, it's on my backpack over there. <laughs> and it has made my everything better. So death comes at the end, cherished in my heart. And it's also a really good family, genre, uh, family drama. And as often is the case with Christy, we have a bit of a romance subplot. 
who all the things working together. She yeah. comes, her family dramas are the best. Like yeah. that is like peak Agatha Christie. The other stuff, fun, absolutely. Yeah. But when she gets in the family drama, that's peak. Yeah. What about you? What you got? I am doing the Bodies in the Library series. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's six. I've read five of them so far. So uh, they're a series of short stories put together by an editor named T Tony Medawa, I believe. Um, I read them all in audio. He has, so, okay, Golden Age Mystery. We think of Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Niall Marsh. Like, those are the names that have come out of that. But um, there are so, so many writers from that era that kind of haven't made it to modern times. And that's just the nature of publishing. There are people who will be wildly popular in their lifetime. And then as soon as they're gone, so is their, like, the public recognition that they ever existed. So what Tony Manawa did is he went through and, like, did research on who were the top writers of that era. There were, like, a ton got short stories from each one of them because that was very much a thing. Like you were publishing novels, you were also publishing short stories in magazines, newspapers, part of collections and anthologies and stuff. And he put together this huge collection called Bodies from the Library. Mm -hmm. A little play on Agatha Christie there. <laughs> and then with each story, you get the short story and then you get like a one page biography on the author and like it's just really like these people were fascinating. Like, you know, they're one minute you know, in England writing all of these stories. And then like the next minute they've moved to California or writing like the top TV shows at the time. Like they had incredible lives. So I really, really enjoyed this series. Um, so some of the stories are like fantastic and totally into it. They're all murder mysteries. Well, all mysteries. Most of them are murder mysteries, but all mysteries. You know, some of them are like novella length. Some of them are like literally they were a paragraph in the newspaper, all different size. Some are fantastic. Some are like, you were famous, why? <laughs> The collection is primarily British. Um, there are some American writers in there just because there were at this time, British like writers were more popular. And which is kind of interesting to me because it was more of a female writing position in England. And so you get a ton of female writers. It was more of an American, a male thing in America. The level of cringe that that causes sometimes, <laughs> which he will write in there like, Hey, just so you know, like I totally know that there's some very uncomfortable things in this book, and he address like he'll he'll address them beforehand, like like I'm putting these here as like a point of history, mm -hmm. so you know what people were reading at that time. But we acknowledge that like this is uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's one guy who wrote like a series of books about like an Aboriginal detective, and it's just like no, <laughs> no, <laughs> this isn't gonna fly in today's society. <laughs> It was fascinating, but also like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, to me, really, really fascinating, like little capsules of history mm -hmm. with the mix of the storytelling, then also like the history of the writers, which again, very brief, like one page biographies of them. But yeah, it's been like a really fun series to do and introduces you to a bunch of writers that in their own time were extremely popular and like are, there's no naked name recognition for them now. Yeah. How interesting. That's a, a great fun. recommendation. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, we actually did do this rapid fire. We were good. We yeah. stuck to rapid fire because our last rapid fire was like still an hour long episode. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we'll go ahead and end it there. Those are our rapid fire recommendations across different genres with a bit of a gothic flair from Emily <laughs> and a bit of a classics flair from me. And no one is surprised. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, guys, for joining us. And we will see you on the next one. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.